Imagine a grubby working man named John. He's 32, but he looks older. Shipyard life spares no one. John wakes up at 5 a.m., or rather, his insistent alarm bell wakes him up. Because after Lost Noise shift, it's hard for him to get up and go to work. He quickly puts on his work clothes as Drink Strong Team takes a small piece of bread and hurries to his usual place in Harland and Wolf's shipyard to build Titanic. Life of shipyard workers in the early 20th century was harsh to say the least. They worked not 8 but 12 hours, often without a day off. Breaks? Never heard of them. This luxury service emerged many years after. John, along with other workers totaling about 3,000 men, did work requiring tremendous physical strength. The main tasks involved lifting steel beams, riveting, and all this with constant noise, dust, and rumbling. Riveting, by the way, was one of the most dangerous jobs. Every day, people were walking around the shipyard with burns, cuts, and injuries were almost the norm here. But there were more serious incidents. There were fatalities during construction, variously estimated between 8 and 15 people, and 246 people were seriously injured. Now there is a memorial plaque at the Harland and Wolf shipyard. Nevertheless, being a shipyard worker was considered a great fortune. Belfast was a city where industry became the center of life. Working on the Titanic guaranteed a steady income, and that's a lot of luck among ordinary working men. Imagine you're working on the construction of the biggest ship in the world. The men were proud to build the Titanic. It was already called the Ship of Dreams, and working on it was a dream job. Of course, the salary wasn't great, but it was more than you could get elsewhere. It is said that the laborers involved in the construction of the Titanic were getting about $10 a week, whereas for bakers it was a monthly income. The Harland and Wolf shipyard is a real monster of its time. Check out my episode from Belfast where I visit this shipyard and you can see what it looks like now. You'll find the link in the description. There were special docks and cranes back then that could lift steel plates weighing several tons. It would take about two to three hours on foot, depending on pace and route, to get around the whole shipyard, including docks, workshops, construction sites, and infrastructure. The shipyard was over 80 acres, about 324,000 square meters. The shipyard was divided into zones. The main construction dock, where the Titanic and its sister ship, the Olympic, were assembled. Hangars were parts were manufactured, warehouses and foundries. The crane system included the famous Goliath, a huge crane that was also a marvel of engineering at the time. Tours of modern museums related to the history of the Titanic and the shipyard often take an hour and a half to two hours. Hours. You can imagine the scale of the facility. Every day in human effort, under the shouts of foremen, the clatter of hammers, the constant rattle of metal cutters. In the boiler rooms, more than a hundred stokers worked in shifts, feeding coal by hand, maintaining 159 furnaces. The steam intensity, fuel supply and stocking were regulated by an engineer from the control bridge of the engine room with a boiler telegraph and stoking indicator. Also on the ship were stifflers whose job was to bring coal to the furnaces and throw ash overboard. There were whole crews laboring at the riveting. One worker would hit the metal rivets to red hot, the second would hold them with pliers, and the third, usually the strongest in the team, would hammer the rivets into the structure with a force that could make the whole shipyard hum. One team could drive a hundred rivets per shift, and this monotonous drudgery was repeated every day. It took more than 3 million rivets that connected the huge steel plates of the hull. Although some of them were installed using hydraulic equipment, most of it was hammered in by hand. I'll also add a little visual to this whole picture. The Titanic is being built in the early 20th century, measuring the perspective of the city. The tallest building in Belfast is the Albert Memorial Clock, 34 meters high. It was the main architectural landmark of the city at the time. And now let's compare it to the height of the structure made to build the Titanic. Let me remind you that the Titanic itself was 270 meters long and over 50 meters high. And the platform with all the cranes in the shipyard was 260 meters long and 82 meters wide. The height was 68 meters to the top crane. It was built from more than 6,000 tons of steel. In the middle were the world's largest rotating cranes. 
Upstairs were four traveling cranes and downstairs were five walking cranes on each side. There were also four elevators to get people to the job site. Now imagine how this monster towered over the city skyline, completely dominating the shipyard area. All this gigantism emphasized the shipyard's superiority over the city. All of this demonstrated the level of engineering progress of the time and the importance of the shipbuilding industry to the city. To build the Titanic, the special Thompson Dry Dock had to be built beforehand. It became the largest in the world so that they could cram the Titanic in there, or rather cram it out of there. The dock was almost 259 meters long, width is 30. And that's not all, the harbor itself. It had to be deepened and widened so the Titanic could be accommodated in Belfast waters and safely put to the sea. That was truly an engineering revolution. Of course, it wasn't all done just for the Titanic. In its more than 150-year history since 1861, the shipyard has built 1,700 seagoing vessels, large and small. The early years from 1861 to 1900 were mostly built sailing ships and steam-powered vessels. One of the first major customers was White Star Line, for which they later built the Titanic. Then begins the golden era of liners from 1900 to 1930. That's when they built the Titanic, the Olympic and the Britannic sister ships. By this time, the shipyard was a world leader in shipbuilding. Military orders, of course, during both world wars, the shipyard was actively producing warships, including destroyers, aircraft carriers and supply ships. Second half of the 20th century, the emphasis was on building tankers, cargo ships and industrial ships. These days, whether we like it or not, Harland and Wolf has cut back on shipbuilding and moved into repairing, modernizing and building offshore platforms. The company is in decline and when I was there a couple of years Years ago, I was looking at the project to make a residential neighborhood out of it. I told you in one of the episodes that you can watch on the channel who funded the construction project, who was on board, what was on board, and how much money went into ship and then with the ship to the bottom of the ocean. But while we're discussing the construction of the Titanic, the wonders of engineering, what um, may be concerning you, these rivets. With all the marvels, one of the most discussed mistakes in the construction of the ship is the poor stability of the rivets that join the metal plates of the hull. Um, did they save up some money? Of course, somewhere they chipped out, something wasn't tested and the rivets were driven in by hand on the conditions of constant haste. In fact, we get low-quality iron rivets that had slag inclusions, causing them to lose impact strength as well. After collision, the rivets burst, causing cleavage of the hull steel plates. As a result, instead of localized damage, the ship received a long series of holes, which accelerated its sinking. The materials were considered advanced at the time, but in terms of modern engineering, they had flaws. The University of Missouri conducted a study and found that steel used contained elevated amounts of sulfur, oxygen and phosphorus, making it less ductile and more brittle, especially at low temperatures. In the cold water of the North Atlantic, about minus 2 degrees, the steel became brittle. Instead of bending on impact, it cracked. This greatly increased the damage to the hull. That explains why the surviving witnesses of the shipwreck heard a terrible cracking sound. When steel breaks, you hear a sound resembling a long groan, but not a crack. This can happen if the steel is really brittle and prone to cracking. At the dawn of the 20th century, British steelmakers used open hearth furnaces, producing products with a relatively high retention of phosphorus, oxygen and sulfur, which makes steel much more brittle at low temperatures. Now the construction of the bulkheads. The watertight bulkheads did not reach all the way to the upper deck, causing water to overflow their upper edges if several compartments were flooded. As a result, after hull damage, water consistently filled more compartments than was designed. Well, as I said, at that time there were no standards for testing materials under conditions similar to the collision with the iceberg. The hull still was not tested for stability at low temperatures and finally, the lifeboats, which were set three times fewer, 20 instead of 16. Do you know the main reason why they did that? aesthetics, so they wouldn't spoil the look of the ship. Just to remind you, the Titanic was a luxury ship. Rolls-Royce in the world of ships, billionaires sailed on it. What kind of lifeboats can we talk about when the ship is not sinkable? 
add poor radio communications, lack of proper training, the crew simply did not have evacuation procedures training, full training was not done. Well, finally, modern research has shown that if better materials has been used or some structural measures had been followed, the Titanic might have had a chance to stay afloat longer or even avoid sinking completely. Friends, thank you for watching. Check out my other video on the Titanic in Belfast where I did a review of the Titanic Museum on the site of the former Harlington Wolf shipyard. And if you'd like to learn a language abroad, visit Ireland, the Titanic Museum, Game of Thrones sites, see the famous castles and caves, so then go to our website smaps.com to book a place in a kid's camp. If you already know the language perfectly, the consultants will find a university for you.